um, who is a dear friend of mine um, and who's been someone who's been doing this healing work uh, specifically with with men, men of color uh, for for many years. And um, we've had the pleasure to work together. And so I'm excited to have this conversation with him. Um, before I start, though, I wanted to like, like make note of some things that two things like three things, actually. So one, when it comes to our 90 day 90,000 campaign, um, we're at $40,000. So the ad is huge. I wish I had like the thing in the background where they could be like, oh, shh. <laughs> so you know, we're making good progress with that. And we're really happy and grateful for all of the people who've taken the time and, you know, been able to like donate. We know it's like some really hard times. And so any dollar that you can donate is like greatly appreciated. Um, the other thing is today is Giving Tuesday. All of you probably had your inboxes flooded with like requests and information about nonprofits about Giving Tuesday. And um, for us at Men Healing, we have like a special like Giving Tuesday situation in which um, we have an, a donor who's been willing to to match uh, $10,000. Um, and so we are at this point where we're like $9,900 um, that's already been donated by all of the gracious and amazing people who've donated to to men healing to create space for us to to heal as men to create this community and do the work that we've been doing for a while um and so we're asking that you just continue to donate and um an easy way for you to donate is you can text um 90 um i n n 90 um and you can text the oh shoot i definitely forgot it's uh Text 90N90 and, oh shoot, the sequence. I'll tell you at the end. I'm sorry about that. Or if someone who's watching and knows can put it in the comments. Um, so let's just get right into it because Jorge, um, you know, like I said, he's a dear friend of mine, someone that I've admired. There's a lot of synergy between our work. Um, we've worked together quite a bit. We actually were on a call today. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, this is kind of funny and this is kind of fun, but Paul has a tremendous, tremendous amount of work, um, uh, information that he can share with, with the field and with people who are interested in doing work with, um, uh, with, with men of color, especially survivors of sexual violence and sexual assault, um, and, and in particularly, uh, Latinx, uh, men of color. Um, so Jorge, why don't you just like introduce yourself, tell a little bit about you, like the work that you've done. Um, actually, what drew you to this work? Like, why have you decided to, like, commit your life to this work? Yeah. Well, first of all, I would like to share that I am from Peru. I'm an immigrant um, in the U.S. The U.S. Has, me, has been my home for now over 30 years. Uh, mm -hmm. Recently moved to Florida. Um, and I lived in uh, New York most of my for like 14, 15 years. And I think a lot of my experience come from that phase of my life, right? Doing a lot of groundwork. And for people who, who, who know me, I started as an outreach worker um, and I've been doing a lot of um, work in the ground um, as an clinician, case management, working directly with community for many, many years. And then about five, six years ago, I joined the national kind of space as a national TA provider. And I work for two uh, Latinx organizations that do national TA uh, provision, which is Casa de Esperanza, which is now Esperanza United. And now I'm currently uh, in Lupe Caminar Latino, uh, which is a culturally specific organization that is based in Atlanta, but has a national arm uh, called Lupe. Um, and I'm currently transitioning out of that, as you know, Richard, and um, define myself as a cultural leader who has been in this work for a long time, who's really passionate about this work and sees many opportunities to build collectively and do a lot of healing work together with folks all over the U.S. Yeah, yeah. And what drew you to this, Jorge? Like, what was it that, like, was the lure? Uh, was it a calling? Were you chosen? Like, chosen. I love that I mean, word. Chosen. Chosen is good. <laughs> I like chosen. I love chosen. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was it was a personal healing for myself, right? Um, mm -hmm. But I've learned in doing direct work. I think a lot of us, when we start this work, there's a separation between them and us. 
in a lot of the ways that we hold mm -hmm. space. And what I learned early on in my career that the person who I was doing testing, who I was doing case management, I could be one of those persons, right? I could be one of the people that mm -hmm. I'm, could be one of the people going through it. Um, and when I realized that, I, it helped me also to see what is my personal experience through this work. You know, I think white culture, as you know, Richard, and as everybody knows, they separate, right? Professional from per personal. But for me, the combining of those were, were the magic, the secret sauce of who I am and what I do um, and how I become alive in this work is when those two things unite because a lot of my personal experience has informed the way that I do this work and the way that I push within systems and the way I work with community. So a lot of my personal um, things that, you know, that I have gone through um, have informed the work that I do. And, you know, when, when we talk about healing and we talk about all of this heart-to-heart -heart connection, it comes from the idea of, for me, removing the shame that I had uh, about the choices that I was making. Um, mm -hmm. Choices that I was making that were um, unhealthy around uh, sexual, sexual choices, high risk situations, you know? So thinking about my story around the shame around it and mm -hmm. why was I putting myself at risk or why I was allowing certain things to happen, right? So I put it in a context for me to understand it through sexual abuse, through uh, uh, being sexualized by white men, by racism, by immigration, right? So when I put all of those things into context, it made me realize that the decisions that I was making is not just about my personal, you know, it was mm -hmm. a decision, but it was all of these factors that influenced the way that I was making decisions. And that helped me, that realization and that intersectionality um, kind of work, remove shame from myself. Right, um, and it also that's the same work that I do with folks when I'm holding space. Right, when when people come in, they're like, I don't know why I keep doing the same thing that I do. You know, why is it that I'm not making the right choices in my life? Why is it that I keep choosing, you know, to stay with this person? And, and as we kind of deconstruct all of the factors um, that allow for people to make those choices, right? Um, thinking about accessibility to resources, transportation, thinking about accessibility, um, all of those stuff, right? Um, then we kind of help people um, to remove the shame around it and then we can kind of get them into the healing process, right? Because then we share responsibility, both systematic and individually, right? And mm -hmm. so and that's the idea of my work and what I've been doing um, now in the national space. Yeah. Yeah, Jorge, one of the things that I've always found really, like, amazing about your gift is your ability to, like, you know, really see things through the perspective of others or consider the perspective of other folks. And I think that is like one of the main factors in like reducing shame, right? Because oftentimes pe people feel like they're, they're alienated, they're isolated and like no one can relate to what they're going through or no one even cares to relate to like what they're going through. And one of the things that you've consistently done since I've, I've known you, you know, for several years now, it's like always be very mindful of like the different lived experiences and perspective of other folks and try to consider that. Um, and I think that's like been like an amazing offering to the field and to the work um, because you're right, there's this westernized Eurocentric worldview um, that comes under the guise of professionalism that creates this like, you know, this dynamic where there's us and them, right? Professional and personal and professional and the client. Um, but the reality is when it comes to people of color, like, you know, um, we were once clients and we could be clients and we still are clients, quote unquote, quote, you know what I mean? But at the same time, like, and, and so like given all of these like systemic factors that you've named, right? That are contributing to like our experiences here. Like it's, it makes sense that, you know, you would take these things into consideration when you when you think about your your way of like holding space. So what have you like gathered? Because I know something that's really important to you is like really relying on like indigenous practices and culturally specific practices. What is something that you pulled from that? How did you connect to that? Um, and like, what could you offer to like other people who are thinking about that? Yeah. In their work? I think the first thing that I would I think offer is how uh, collectively we reclaim practices that has been mm. stolen from us through colonization, right? And that's something that we always talk about, um, Richard, for me, because what colonization has done and also our um, 
uh, invisibility of indigenous um, communities in Peru as a, as a Peruvian immigrant and invisibility of um, black Peruvians, right, has made me create this gap on my story of like, in the beginning of my career saying like, I don't know any healing practices. I'm new at this, you know? Mm. Um, that doesn't come naturally to me. Like, or sometimes we say we're not the experts of that, mm -hmm. right? But then mm -hmm. when, we, when we reclaim our stories and our heritage, we realize that we do come from a historical context of healing, of surviving, of having all of these tools, right? That we have, that we that we have, um, that we have inherited through generations and generations. And a lot of our work is to reclaim that. Um, and to also learn from people who have already been doing um, the work. Um, so a lot of the work that I've been doing, especially I've been really focused, especially on the work that I do around the healing, around sexual abuse, it's about storytelling. It, uh, and it's the way that I could kind of model um, the way that I have done the healing um, in order to disrupt the silencing, disrupt abuse, um, call out, organizations who are also being harmed, who are also being harmful to communities. And at the same token, I'm also modeling, um, especially for men, how to be in a more heart-to-heart -heart space with one another, that not everything has to be uh, from the head, right? It could also be in the holding uh, each other through the pain, holding each other through um, the idea that we don't know, and we don't have to be we always have to have the answers like us men, right? Like sometimes it's good to be on the journey and just be curious and be in the alignment of discovery. And so how do we model that to folks? Um, and I also have to say that a lot of the healing has also been um, the learning through women, right? Mm -hmm. Women in my life, because when I was in the healing process, um, a lot of the spaces that was offered for me as a, as a male was talk therapy, right? Mm -hmm. The only way that people would give me like tools, like let's talk about it, let's you know, break this down. And what I think what women in my life and mentors have given me is the idea of connection to my body. How do I listen into my intuition? How do I listen um, to the yearning of my soul in many ways, right? Um, how do I pay attention um, to the energy right, to the energy that I'm invoking, the energy of the space that I am entering. So I've learned that through, through women, through women. And there's many women in my life, right, like from all over. I mean, I will we'll probably have to do like 15 minutes to name all of the women, but there's been so many women in my life and, and I try to bring them along um, so I could also center them because that's where I learned a lot of the, a lot of those healing strategies, right. Um, so it's been all of that, right, so it's been, how do we pay attention to the energy? How are we kind of connected um, collectively together? Uh, the tapping, astrology, you know, um, journaling. So, and I, and I think a lot of folks, when they hear that, they think, well, tomorrow I'm gonna go in and I'm just gonna introduce all of these things, right? Um, and you know, when you work with folks, is you introduce them slowly through the process of healing, right? Um, so for example, if you have a male that um, that is kind of getting used to uh, talk therapy, is how you teach them to kind of create a pause, right? At that moment, it's like, you know, I feel like you're going really fast and you're telling your story. I feel like you're trying to get to an end with your story. Can we just take a moment to take like a deep breath and like, let's see how that feels, right? And so that we can kind of help um, uh, people move through that, through that process so they could get used to um, kind of bringing that into their life, you know? Yeah. I think the place, but you, you, can, you can hold and redirect me to uh, Richard. No, 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 I love it. Everything you're saying is on point, like, and I appreciate it because it's like, and it's interesting too, because like, yeah, we come with lived experiences and like, you know, we've had this chance to like try to reclaim like indigenous practices. And one of the things I'll say about indigenous practices too is like, and this is something specifically for like African-American folks, right? Because like some of the ways that we've healed from the consistent and constant trauma that we've been exposed to, whether it was systemic or whether it was interpersonal, um, may look differently. And like, you know, practitioners and therapists be like, you know, why are these people dancing? Why are these people singing all the time? But like, all of these things are really like directly connected to indigenous practices that 
you know, we may not even be able to make those connections, but they support us in our healing journey, right? Because it allows us to connect with our body in ways that talk therapy doesn't, right? And I was just listening to something from Vessel Vandekalt, and he was talking about, like, he just re it reiterated the fact that, like, trauma is not a rational thing. It's not, it's not a cognitive thing. It's something that lies beneath the surface. And so if we're talking about male survivorship of, of sexual abuse and sexual violence, right? We know that that's traumatizing. We know that that's something that's oftentimes beyond our recognition where we can't even remember, remember those experiences. And so engaging in the process of talk therapy and psychotherapy in order to try to help people heal, um, oftentimes is a myth for us, right? And we need to like get into our bodies. We need to get into our spirits in a way that like allows us to like tap into. Sometimes things healing for me has come through my dreams, right? Like conversations that I've had with, with, with my grandmother in my dreams that provided a space of healing for me that I wasn't even aware of. And I wake up in the morning and I feel light and I feel refreshed. And so I love the fact that you're always talking about the importance of the reclamation of indigenous practices in our healing journey, because we have to figure out ways that like support our healing um, that may not look right. And that's the thing too about this Eurocentric and like Western ways of like knowing it's like, if it does, if it's not consistent with, you know, what, what's the dominant and mainstream culture's perspective of healing, then it's not valid. And that in itself creates shame. So I love that you always offer that. Yeah. Say a little bit more. Uh -huh. Go ahead. Go ahead. And I also wanted to say, because I think, you know, as, as men that are learning these techniques, right, and that are also kind of intrigued about other forms of other modalities that is not a traditional um, modalities that is being taught to a lot of clinicians. I think we also have to call out the role of clinicians to check mm -hmm. out their around what masculinity is and how do we for men. Because mm -hmm. what tends to happen is that we read the person that comes in and let's say that there's a hyper-masculine performing dude that enters a space or, or, or a hyper-masculine a uh, femme, right? Uh, uh, a woman that is that is um, that is masculine presenting, right? We already mm -hmm. kind of hold that certain like biases in place of bias around that person that this person may not be interested in doing this work, may not be interested in astrology, may not be interested in energy work, and so we're no longer curious about their healing stories, their healing, um, their body stories. We're not, we're not interested in that because we're already making assumptions about the person who's walking into the room. And I learned that um, in, um, in HIV counseling, actually, right? When I was um, kind of training HIV counselors on how to ask questions for men, one of the things that we have to get uncomfortable with is asking men that present, right, like a certain way to ask them, do you have sex with other men? And a lot mm -hmm. of people wouldn't ask that. It's like, oh, I don't think I'm having sex with men. I was like, why? Why would you? Why would you think that? It's like, oh, because they're presenting. They're not like feminine, you know. They, mm -hmm. they they're not gay. They're not, you know. And I'm like, you should always ask that question, regardless of whatever you think. You should always ask that question because you never know if it's an experience that the person is having. And we also know that sexuality is fluid, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think it's also a call out to providers and to mental health clinicians who are holding space for men to also look at the values that we have around masculinity or whoever enters our room, right? Um, because we need to expand um, some of those healing, um, uh, those healing practices, um, and not just for women, but also for men, because I think a lot of men are looking into other more modalities, right? Um, and I think a lot of organizations are not prepared to hold that space. Um, so I think it's also, it's very important. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, one of the other things that you talk about, Jorge, a lot is like liberation, right? And, you know, one of the things I believe is that like power distills down, you know, trauma distills into down to powerlessness, right? And so the process of the reclamation of our power um, whether it's like reconnecting to our indigenous practices and our ways of knowing and being, um, that's a process of, of, you know, the reclamation of our power as well, like, you know, becoming more empowered. What does that mean to you, like the liberation process and how does that connect to like survivorship and the work that you do um, with individuals and collectives? Yeah. And I'm glad that you mentioned trauma because I think when we're in trauma, 
it is hard to envision or to dream of liberation, right? Because we are so wounded at that moment. Um, and I think that's why healing spaces for our cultural leaders is really needed. I think, you know, uh, a little shout out for Richard and I, because that's what we're dreaming, right? The possibility of like, healing circles for cultural leaders. And that's an initiative that we're starting soon. So we're excited about that. Um, because I know that a lot of people have a lot of ideas and a lot of um, thoughts on how they want to do this work differently. But then they get into this trauma bond that they have either with their families, either with themselves, either with their community that are attending. And so then the liberation is delayed, right? And then we also think about economic justice too in that conversation, because for me to ask cultural leaders to attend the healing circles, we need two things, right? We need for them to have money so they could take that time so they could come into the space. And we can also think about systematic, are we giving space for cultural leaders to come into the space so they could have that hour devoted to themselves without thinking about, you know, work responsibilities, being pulled for like a thousand meetings, being overloaded with work. You know, we know that cultural leaders in mainstream organizations often do 15 jobs on top of their jobs, right? Like we know that INX leaders, right? Like they're asked to um, to do the outreach, the case management. Uh, sometimes organizations have one Linux um, provider for 30 people, 50 people, right? In top of that, they have to do the translation. And so when do you create a healing circle or healing space for leaders so they could kind of tell you or transform or push systems, right? Um, and so we have to also think about all of those elements. Um, and I think liberation also, um, you know, I was just having this conversation. It's also to put into context, depending on where you're at, right? Like, like if you're in the beginning stages of your career, like when I think about my journey, I thought my liberation would come in through my alignment to white folks, right? Because mm -hmm. that's what I thought, right? Like if I played the game right, then I know I'm going to be able to find liberation, right? Like I will have more money, I'll have more stability, blah, blah, blah. And, and so it was always about improving myself to fit in and to assimilate, right? Mm -hmm. So I think younger, at the younger age, I realized that no matter how much I played this game, is I'm never going to be in the club, right? I'm not going to be in the club and, and have access to all of that. And then you have my identity as a gay man with working in gay in male spaces, often I am not like male enough, right? So if you think about the intersectionality of like both gender and also sexuality it comes in all of that space, right? Um, and for me, I played that game for too long and then I realized that my liberation is not gonna come through that. My mm -hmm. liberation is gonna come through that alignment to my center where my power is, reclaiming who I am, reclaiming my uh, my historical uh, like knowledge, and my ancestral knowledge, um, doing my own healing work. That's where my liberation is, come, is gonna come because then I'm gonna question everything that is being given to me. And then in the questioning, it's gonna, I'm gonna realize that everything that has been created is not been for me. And so when I push that, when I do that, I think there's gonna be liberation because I'm kind of connecting to my power at that moment, right? Um, and I'm also privileged enough to work remotely that I don't have to work in an office. I've been working remotely. I have financial stability, all of that stuff, right? So, so that's where I think about liberation. There are stages to it. There's a context to it. Um, it really requires a lot of healing to get into this space. And then it also requires a collective mindset that I think that we're also mm -hmm. not used to because the way that we have designed even our programs, our work is always very silo, right? Mm -hmm. When we even thinking about like the HIV and domestic violence movement, right? Like they never cross paths. When we know that for women, a lot of the rape has been caused in in in, in marriages, right? Because for men, you know, we think we have 24 access to women's bodies, right? And for the most of the part, when you do HIV testing for women, you realize that women have had have been raped multiple times by their by their husbands, right? And in that moment, they never question if they have a condom, not have a condom. They can negotiate safe for sex. So it makes sense to kind of bring it together, right? Like that, that, that emerging of, of, of movements. But for some reason, we continue to work um, separately, right? Mm. And so we, and we continue to have this myth that predominantly gay men are higher risk. So we're, we intervene, we create uh, medical responses to gay men, but we never like assess women. Right. Um, 
And so all of those things kind of combine and I think is multi-layer into this conversation for me. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you said, you said so much, like one of the things that you said that really hit me was like, this is constant state of trying to fit as black and brown people and like all of these spaces, right? And, and the more we fit, the more we become decentered and like disconnected from our true selves and disaligned from who we are. And that yeah. definitely is not, that's antithetical to liberation. That's antithetical to, you know, the, the personal freedom that we strive to have that is a result of the alignment with who we are. Yeah. Um, and so you said that, that was powerful. And then the other thing, you know, when you think about um, this whole like systemic perspective too, right? And that that's one of the reasons why, you know, I was like, yeah, I want to work with men healing, right? When I talked to Jim and he talked about like, you know, social justice work and system change work and like what's the stance that men healing has when it relates to that? Because we know it's not always about healing the individual, right? Transformative justice is talking to like, let's transform these systems that perpetuate harm right, to perpetuate harms in subtle ways sometimes that they influence us to believe that the way that we can be free or the way that we can be successful is through this process of fitting, acclimating, acculturating, um, that is a constant denial of our true selves and our own individual identities and collective identities. And that's the reason why, you know, I, I thought that this was a good space for me. And it has been because men healing is not only just focus on healing individuals, but like also like let's heal these systems. Let's do some advocacy work to talk about, you know, what look what does healing look like collectively, challenging this Eurocentric dynamic and worldview as it relates to uh clinical and therapeutic work, right? Um and and that's the reason why and I'm kinda gonna go and transition because we got two minutes left. Um I wanna ask you though, before I go into my transis transition like commercial mode um which is a good commercial not all bad commercials are bad good all commercials are bad but is there anything like the last thing that you want to offer like folks um specifically folks who are working you know you're a social worker right you know you didn't mention that but i know you're a social worker at the msw um you're a clinician um there are a lot of people who will listen to this even if they're not listening tonight when it's stored on youtube who are clinicians who want to work with male survivors who work with male survivors who are Latinx, black and brown folks, um, what would you offer them as like some insight and perspective that they can take into consideration with their work in addition to what you said, like two things, bits of advice? Two, two things, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm push you a little harder. <laughs> uh... I think it's a, so my story, and I know that we haven't like dived deep into my story. My story, I think, unites with thousands of stories of cultural leaders who have been voicing, who have been saying similar things, right? Around intersectionality, listening to cultural leaders, doing this way in a different way. I think this is where the system readiness for me comes in. Is like, when are systems going to make changes to create something new, right? Mm -hmm. um, as we have been saying this for a really long time. Um, and so, I, and, and I think the trajectory of most programs or organizations or initiatives is like, you know, we, we get this idea of doing this work. I want to submit something so I could get some money for it, but we never ask community and how we want this work to be shaped, how we want to do this work. That we get this, this initiative going and when things are not working out is when we start bringing people that look like the community so they could do the heavy lift so they could get in um, um, so they could you know successfully finish the grant and so at that moment there's no trust and there's no access because we are kind of doubting is it done with intentionality for the betterment of my community or are you doing it to submit you know, to finish this grant cycle and then you're going to leave. And for the most part, most of us do this work um, in cycles when there's funding available, right? And so what I would say is, like, how do you listen to community mm. and stop, like, doing the listening sessions and all of those things when community is already telling you a lot of information and then now it's on you to make those choices, to make those space for, for your institutions to really do this work 
in a different way. So I would say that I think as a major, that's where I push a lot. It's like when somebody asks us to do work, it's like, okay, are you ready to do this in this way? Or you just want to do like Band-Aid and then we kind of move through that conversation, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then I would say always think about safety. Are people safe in your, in your place? Is everybody safe? And if it's not, even if one person is not safe, is how do we get into the safety of everybody in your organization, in your space, so we can do this? And, and also preparing people um, to hold space for men in a different way. You know, um, mm. some of us are dying to understand, like, how do we listen to our bodies and how, how our disconnection that comes from, like, the day that we are born, you know, of, like, telling us not to cry or as a gay man that, that I am um, just different, right? That I'm not supposed to feel love for another man, right? Like, all of those experiences, sexual abuse, uh, sexualization around sex, right? Like that has created a separation. So we have to understand the stories of this connection for men. And for that, we have to really center um, black and men into this work. And I think, as you know, Richard, a lot of research is predominantly and historically has been on white men. And it mm -hmm. hasn't centered about our lived realities. It is why I think there's so many of the gaps that we have currently in our system because it's a historical context that everything that has been created has been for white men. And so now we're at the stage where we're like, okay, so what do, what do folks want, you know? Um, so there's, there's a lot of, of work to be done with, with, uh, with our needs and the nuances of, of our healing and strategies and all of that. But there are great organizations that are doing amazing work. And so I think if people want to really be connected, um, then we can you know, provide all of those informations. Yes, thank you, thank you, Jorge. And last thing, um, and Men Healing is also an organization that's making that transition mm -hmm. and really trying to emphasize the importance of, you know, hearing from the community, making sure that the work that's being done is informed by those who are directly impacted. And they are also assuming leadership roles. Mm -hmm. um, and so your donations on this Giving Tuesday would be like going directly towards those efforts to really create more spaces so that we can um, make the services and the work that men healing have been doing for so many years accessible to, you know, communities of color and other folks and other male survivors who have not had uh, access to this, to these services and this, this work. Um, thank you, Jorge. Thank you. Those who joined. Um, take care. Hey. Saludos. Saludos.